we have a Chevy Cobalt and it's here because they're saying they feel a wobble at higher speeds uh, looking at both of the tires they both look like this where the wire is showing on both tires uh, I checked everything nothing is loose everything is nice and tight but they told me uh, maybe like a year ago or a few months ago they had inner tie rods put on the car I guarantee what's going on here is well I know who put the tie rods on so I know it wasn't done by a shop meaning no wheel alignment was done so they got the tie rods done and they never took it in for a proper wheel alignment and it's eating up the tires so there's no parts required on this car it's basically just gonna need a new set of tires and take it in for a proper wheel alignment drywall screws all right so i'm out taking this mazda for a test drive and all that clunking noise we had up front is gone it sounded like bad stabilizer links you know like a clunk clunk every time you go over bumps and it's completely gone it was the brake pads every time you hit a bump the brake pad would bounce up and down inside of the caliper bracket and cause that uh that clunking noise so it's all gone car is fixed with a proper set of brake pads that is crazy who would have thought that right uh, it's kind of hard to explain this to some customers because they just don't understand they say well the pads are new and they're for the car how could that cause a noise like that you know and they they think uh, they're just trying to waste their money but a case like this car is fixed and after the first test drive you know it's hard to see but the new pad is already starting to remove that lip of rust that was right on the edge right there because the pads actually fit how they should nice got a Ford Focus here that came in on the hook and if we look down oh this would be almost impossible to see see that it looks like the uh, compressor clutch has fell off of the actual compressor and it's wedged up against the rail right there and it's crazy see if I could uh, knock it out of place at least so we could get the get the uh, engine started and move the car I was able to use a pry bar to just kind of knock this stuff out you could see this is the clutch for the AC compressor and it just it's completely destroyed I doubt the AC on this car even worked um, so I'm pretty sure the owners not gonna want to get that replaced but um another big issue I see going on here is look at that pulley right there you see it it's really hard to tell but it is severely worn out so uh, with this out of here we can get the get the engine running again and i'm gonna see if the owner wants to replace the belt and that uh that pulley and now that I remember she brought it to me a few months ago to put a new belt on it and during that time I told her about that pulley and she said oh I'll get it done next time well yeah so I don't know they may not want to get anything done if I tell them hey I was able to knock this out and the car runs down they may just say leave it like that I'm just gonna keep driving it like that all right so we got a uh, what year is it 95 yeah we got a 95 Accord here um, and it's here for some decent amount of work we got done we did the o-ring on the distributor we did uh, the front stabilizer links uh, the VTEC solenoid gaskets and the valve cover gasket now we're getting done the rear brakes as you can see it's getting new pads and rotors back here here's the stuff that came off you see it's looking pretty crusty yeah be a big improvement all right so about two hours ago i did front brakes on a i don't know a malibu no impala yeah uh so the owner did not drop off the car he was here with me the whole time i did the front left side first and then i came to the front right side and i zipped the bolts on for the caliper bracket to the knuckle with my little 3 8 impact gun right and then normally I would grab something to torque down the bolts and torque them down, make sure it's nice and 
you know, tight. But the owner starts asking me questions and we get to talking and I continue with the job. And for the life of me, I could not remember if I tightened or torqued, I should say, if I torqued down those two bolts that hold the caliper bracket to the knuckle. So I had to call the owner back. It's been like two hours. So I had to call him back and tell him, hey, can you bring your car back so I could double check it? Uh, just so I could have peace of mind tonight. You know what I mean? So he said he would bring it back. But it's just, it's so, it's kind of embarrassing. But, you know, I'd rather play it safe than just leave it alone and just be like, oh, it'll be all right. No, I, I won't be able to sleep. But this is part of the reason why I don't like people in my garage when I'm working. This is why I don't have a radio in the garage. People ask me, how come you don't, gotta, how come you don't listen to music while you're working on cars? Because I know how I am. I easily get distracted, okay? So when I'm working on cars, no music, don't talk to me, you know? I'd rather have people sit in their car than watch me because then they start asking questions and I start talking. And stuff like this happens. It's just, it's embarrassing at the end of the day. I mean, I'm sure it'll be fine. Uh, he's gonna bring the car back so I could double check those two bolts. But it's something that should have never happened. Got a 2015 Dodge Journey. It came in for an oil change and a tune-up. Over the phone, the owner told me she had a four-cylinder in her car. So I quoted her for that, right? Thought it was going to be easy. Knock it out. She gets here. and Whoa, whoa, settle down. We have a V6 here. So obviously, it's a bit more complicated. You know, like the intake manifold has to come off to, uh, to get to the spark plugs. So that was a new quote on that. And she denied the job because she said it was going to cost too much. So we're just going to go ahead and knock out the oil chains today. I'll put in a air filter and a fog light. And uh, it's crazy with this this fan. Story is it just it got stolen a few months ago, and it's been you know held you know by like the pound or something like that because all kinds of legal paperwork. And she just got it back after the car being stolen. So that's why she was trying to get all this maintenance done. Here I'm in a 2010 Dodge Charger. And uh, see all this mess that's going on here? I got some of my tools here, but you know, I brought them in right now just in case. But this is actually how the car showed up. Uh, she said she was having an issue with the car not wanting to come out of park. So she took it to her brother, I think, which she always tends to do this. And, um... I know this woman, I worked in a car a few times. Whenever she's having issues, she always takes it to her brother first. And you would think, oh, well, because she doesn't want to pay you to get it done, right? So her brother would do it for her. No, because he still charges her to do the work. He does crappy, shitty work. And from what I remember correctly, last thing we I had to work in a car, something he touched, he actually charged her more money than what I charged her to do the job, which is freaking crazy. Anyway, so here goes another scenario where the car wouldn't come out of park, so he starts YouTubing videos, right? And he takes everything apart. She said he even broke this right here because he came in here with a knife trying to pry on it. So you see it's cracked now. So all this stuff, you know, some of the stuff is damaged. All this stuff is taken apart with, with no real direction, not knowing what's wrong with the car. You know, just looking at a YouTube video and starts taking everything apart. So I put my scanner on it. And a code that catches my attention is the brake switch performance. Now, if that brake switch is not working correctly, you could hear every time I push the brake pedal, you could hear something over here actuate. You hear that? So if that brake switch is acting up, it's never going to let this thing over here actuate so you could actually take it out of park. So I don't think the problem was over here to begin with. I think we're having an issue with the actual brake switch, which I haven't confirmed it yet, but I think that's where we're going to head with this. And it just sucks because all this stuff is taken apart, stuff got damaged, you know, it's just... I, I tell her, well, I, I don't even know, I, I just, I don't know. Stop taking it to your brother, right? So I tell her, but she still does it. And yeah, so let's go ahead and uh, see if we can figure something out here. Okay, so now I'm in the uh, ABS module. And here goes the codes we have. Again, we have another brake pedal switch, one out of two stuck, and brake pedal switch, one circuit performance. 
Okay, good. That's good to see that. At this moment, I cannot get it tacked up. The brake switch seems to be working every single time. Um, I'm not going to spend too much more time on this. I can't fix something that isn't broken, right? I can't see it acting up. So, uh, as you can see, I started to put things together. All right, so I'm in this Chevy Malibu. I got towed in yesterday. She said she was driving. The battery light came on. And then she lost her power steering. The engine shut off, okay? So, check the serpentine belt. It's still intact. So, it wasn't an issue that, like, the belt broke. And then, you know, alternator is not charging. So, the car eventually dies. That's not the issue. So, I got my jump starter out there. You can see it right there. And I got the, the clamps connected to negative and positive of the battery. But I get absolutely nothing inside of here no power at all when i go directly to battery but i noticed that if i leave the power side on the battery but i put the ground side just somewhere on the chassis i get power in here so let's go check it out so you can see it's on the battery right now and i've tried it multiple times and we get nothing i'm just going to go ahead and move it over to this ground stud right here that on and there we go we have power now car starts up lower this window I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the jump starter and wow instant <laughs> the engine just instantly turned off so obviously here's a ground cable and it splits into two we have a thinner wire going directly into chassis and this connection looks uh halfway decent i mean i don't really if i look at this i would not think that there's a problem right there and then i'm gonna see if i can flip the camera around it might go all crazy on y'all see that stud so that's the main ground for the engine and you can see that one's not looking too happy all right, but let's not uh, let's not jump to conclusions. Uh, let me go get a test light. All right, so here's where I'm at so far. Uh, I used a test light, right, and connected to both of the posts out here, and I couldn't even get the test light to light up at all. So I disconnected uh, both of the harnesses, and I put the test light directly to battery. And like this, the test light does light up. It's very dim, but at least we're getting power across. So the positive side looks pretty clean negative side we got a it's hard to see that but we got a good amount of corrosion right there you can see all the green crusties all right so i checked the battery real fast and this thing's like 7.5 volts that's that's nothing um but let's not forget the fact that even though the car was running as soon as we took power away from it the car turned off immediately um i would think that the alternator should be enough to keep this car running. i know you're not supposed to do that but it should be enough to keep this car running so it is possible that we do have a bad alternator here. The jump starter, just by putting power or turn the power on, we get 10.7 volts, which I'm surprised it even starts the car. And it's, it's kind of shitty because this thing was plugged in. It stays plugged in. It's only at 10.7 volts, whatever. Uh, so 10.7 volts, right? I turn the car on and I check the voltage again and we're still at 10.7, right? So then I came down here to the alternators a positive term terminal and I checked positive right there ground right here and ground right here and we're still getting to 10.7 10.8 volts so we're not losing any like voltage drop across this wire right here I think we simply just have a bad alternator all right so what I'm going to do now is since the battery is completely shot I'm gonna take it out the car and uh, put it in the garage on a trickle charger and just let it charge slowly and just wait till we get the alternator because it might be some time before uh, the owner could drop off an alternator. This is that Chevy Malibu, the one that had just put the brand new uh, wiper linkage in. You can see it right there. So it's one thing after another, right? All right, so I'm in the garage and this is the first time I actually get to use these little things that I bought a while ago and I bought them exactly for this purpose. For whenever I need to trickle charge a battery that has side posts, just go ahead and screw these in. 
and it gives me something to clamp onto so I could trickle charge the battery very easily. And there we go, it's charging. So my game plan is uh, to fully charge up the battery and when I finally get the alternator for that car, I'll reinstall the battery in the car and that'll give me just enough juice to start the engine up and drive it into the garage so I don't have to worry about pushing it or, any, or, or anything like that, you know what I mean? And then uh, once I get in the garage, I'll probably pull it back out again and put it back on the trickle charger while I install the alternator. So my plan worked flawlessly, charged up the battery. Uh, the owner dropped off a remanufactured alternator. So I put the battery in the car, started right up, and drove it into the garage. Checked the battery while it was running, and of course it's still not charging. Alright, so that was probably one of the easier alternators to do. It did not take very much time at all. As you can see, the engines are here. The engines are already running. And we are charging, okay? So that's it. Pretty simple one here. Looking at the alternator that came off it looks like an OEM unit see it says GM right there so if this is indeed the original alternator it's got a good amount of miles on it lasted a pretty long time oh this car just scared the hell out of me so I'm here trying to put the air box back in it right all of a sudden I hear everything power up I'm like what the hell I jump back and the engine starts Obviously, it's running like crap because the mass airflow sensor is not really uh, connected. But I'm like, what the hell? Realized I had the keys in my pocket as I'm leaning up against the car. And the button got pressed for the remote start, I'm guessing. So, as I get in the car and I'm putting the key in, I can't... Turning the key in the off position would not turn the engine off. It took me like a good two minutes to figure out how to turn the engine off. Apparently, all you have to do is uh, <laughs> hit the gas or the brake pedal. Uh, but super sketchy. It's just that's so stupid. Oh, you know what? Let me put these keys down because that just scared the hell out of me. Can you imagine? You're here trying to, you know, do something on the anything. You try and do anything, and the engine just randomly starts. Oh, Jesus Christ! I'm doing the uh, front brakes on this. What is it? A Volvo, some SUV. Uh, but this thing has some massive brakes on it. It's crazy how big the brakes are. And today I broke another one of my Astro tools. It's again, the same sock, it keeps breaking on me. Uh, it's not often, just every few months. Um, first of all, I think it has to do with the thin wall design, which is fine. Some You really do need that for some rims to get this uh, socket to fit. So it's not an issue. The thing is that these, uh, these studs, they were designed here way too tight. Uh, with the mid-torque gun, I put a regular 19 millimeter socket on and I still could not get them off. So I had to pull out the big gun and even this struggled to get the lug nuts off. They were just on there way too tight. At that point, I'm not even surprised that this thing broke at how tight these things were on here. But uh, yeah, it's getting brakes all the way around. So I'm doing uh, pads and rotors up front and pads and rotors in the rear. Sweet, that Volvo that I just did the brakes on. Took it out for a test drive right and as I'm driving around I could hear something in her door panel just like moving around it sounded like a piece of metal so I grabbed it and it was one of these and I've seen these before people can use these to uh, work on cars right they have a nickname for them I can't remember what the nickname was and no I did not steal it so I grabbed it and when the owner came to pick up the car I was like hey why do you have one of these she said oh one time I got locked out of my car and this mechanic came to you know unlocked the car for me and he used the tool and when he left he he forgot the tool in my car so she said it's been in that door panel forever and i was like i'll buy it off of you she goes oh you could just take it i don't care and i was like no no i'll buy it off of you how much do you want so she was like yeah five dollars so i was like all right sweet <laughs> these things are cool i've seen them before this edge right here is like super rigid it's nice good for uh prying things let's see the number on it uh right here it says four one three zero okay so i have to do a voiceover for this but i believe it's a nissan altima the customer brought in because of a clunking noise up front it took me a good 15 minutes to figure out what was going on here and i noticed that the jam nut for the outer tie rod on the right side of the car is not tight you can see the gap right there so i grabbed some penetrating fluid and a wrench expecting it was going to be hard to move but no 
after I sprayed it down I just put my fingers on it and I was able to turn it that's how loose it was so of course I went ahead and tightened it down and yeah it fixed the clunky noise she had that's how loose the tie rod was it's so crazy uh, she said a few months ago she took it to a shop to get all the tie rods changed and a wheel alignment I guess someone simply forgot to tighten the jam nut. It's like 12.30 at night, uh, but I had some free time, so I came into the garage. Just want to get a quick look at the Chevy. Uh, nothing major, but first thing I noticed is there's absolutely no coolant in there. So what I'm going to do is fill it up with water, try to pressurize the system, and see if we can at least see where this coolant is going. Straight up to about 15 psi and it's already dropping and on like the very first few pumps I, I probably got like to like 5 psi and I already found a leak Let's see if we could get in here right there see the water and it's actually dripping right now right off of the uh, thermostat housing so let me see if I can get you guys down here I'm sure you could see that I don't think it's the water pump. If it were the water pump, it would be more like leaking down the block and working its way all the way down. This is just dripping right off of the thermostat housing. So it's uh, it's gonna get a new thermostat housing and gasket. We are back with this Chevy Cruze. As you can see, I got the thermostat off of the car. And I did tell their owner to go to the dealer and get a OEM part. So that's what she did and she dropped off some coolant as well now with the old part off the car it's clear as day of why it failed uh, you can see the gasket down here just a little bit tiny torn not sure if that had anything to do with it but the biggest problem here is if you look right in this corner you can see a big chunk of the plastic is missing and because of that the gasket is able to has basically no reinforcement see that that whole chunk of plastic is missing so if we look at the brand new part uh, how was it I'm already confused okay so it would be this corner right there you could see how the plastic should be alright so I filled up the reservoir right there and I do have it pressurized at the moment I don't see any leaks coming out of the thermostat housing. So let me see if I can get the camera down there. That wasn't the best angle, but it was clear as that you could see it's not dripping anything. And we are still under pressure and it looks like it's holding pretty good here. So I think, I think that's it guys, I think we got a hold of this leak before it caused any real damage like that last Chevy Cruze with the head gasket issue. Alright so I let this sit for a little while while I cleaned up all my tools, I cleaned this up, it's not perfect but looks better right? And still holding pressure. So everything looks good. Here I've got a Ford Escape, I mean a Mazda Tribute. <laughs> and uh came in on the hook because the serpentine belt broke you see it here in pieces and um, yeah so obviously you know lose power steering and alternator and all that stuff um, so it's not as simple as just replacing the belt something caused it to tear like this so looking at the tensioner this thing is completely seized really hard to spin it but I could also see that the belt itself is wrapped around it. So, you know, which came first? Is this pulley seized and it caused too much friction on the belt, caused it to uh, snap? Or did the belt break first and just got jammed inside of here? So I'm gonna try to remove uh, these chunks of belt and see if this pulley is any good. I got the belt out of it and it seems to be spinning pretty good. So, it was a case oh and by the way i did check all of the other pulleys that the belt runs on everything seems to be okay so i don't think something seizing caused the belt to break i think it's just a failed belt 
so the owner opted for putting the old tensioner back on the car to save like the $75 uh, for the crappy, I don't know if it's a Duralast or is it a Valley Craft? No, it's a Duralast, but still $75. Uh, so we're just gonna go ahead and put this one back on it. All right, so we got the new belt in and I ran the engine for a minute or so It ran fine Couldn't hear any weird noises or anything like that. So just Gonna go ahead and put it back together Got this trailblazer back once again. I did the brakes on it. Uh, I don't know maybe a month ago and we noticed That how bad the caliper bracket is worn out you could see the grooves They are super deep of where the pads are supposed to ride so I told the owner to buy a new bracket and it finally came in so we're just uh, swapping over the bracket it's got a new hardware kit on it and it should be all set all right so I just finished replacing a rear left brake caliper that was damaged on this trailblazer the next issue the owner was having is that the blower motor would stay running even with the key out of the ignition and it would kill his battery so of course I confirmed the problem, I put the fuse back in it and the blower motor just turned right on without even the key being in the ignition. So I wanted to test a few things. So here goes the duty cycle for the blower motor connector. As you can see I got it back probed right there. I got the key in the run position. And you see the fan speed right there is on the lowest speed and all I'm going to do is go ahead and raise the fan speed. And we're going to see this uh, pattern change. So I'm going to go ahead and move it up now. See it changing? That's the duty cycle of the blower motor changing. That tells me that, and by the way, I did check the powers in the ground. Everything's okay. All that stuff is good. That tells me that the, the controls right here are working perfectly. The only thing that's bad on this car that's causing this uh, blower motor to stay on is the actual module, which is this piece right here. And you could actually see some corrosion on it. So I was already suspecting that this piece is going to be bad. But being able to look at this and confirm that the input coming from the controls over here, everything is good, everything works as it should. Now I feel confident changing out this part knowing that it's going to fix the car. A 2015 Kia Optima. See the check engine light is flashing and here's the code that we have P1326 it says glow relay stuck on now I tried doing some research on this and I can't really find anything about a glow relay on this car but one thing I can tell you is there is excessive engine noise around two to three thousand rpm let's see if we could hear it Okay, now it doesn't even want to rev up now that the check engine light is flashing. But when it was not flashing, when it was not flashing, uh, once you get to two or three thousand RPM, it sounds like, I don't know, rod knock. Okay, it sounds piston slap, something like that. Worn out uh, connecting rod bearings. That's what it really sounds like. And it's really in the two to three thousand and yeah. So I don't know if there is anything I can do about this. I don't think I'm gonna end up touching this car. Um, I looked online, did some quick research and apparently these, these engines are known for rod knock. Uh, and it should be taken to a dealer and see what they could do about this because that's what it really sounds like to me. So that sucks. All right, so after a little bit more research online, um, Apparently, if like say people are using a snap-on scanner, if their scanner was updated, this code is changed, um, and you would get different different information. So it would still be the P1326, but it would say something about um, the knock sensors picking up knock, and they say it has to do with rod knock. Okay, and that's I'm, I'm, I don't know. I don't want to clear the check engine light, but. Um, if I could let you guys hear, hear it, I would, and it definitely sounds like rod knock. And just to uh, show this off, okay, so I have a tendency of leaving this piece of my scanner, which is just a Bluetooth adapter. Uh, I have a tendency of leaving it in customers' cars, right, because it's easy to forget. So my girlfriend made this for me. It uh, just uses elastics to tie around here, so nothing is permanent. And... Um, 
you know, I told her to put some bright colors on it. So here we have green and blue and it just kind of hangs down. It just, it's a little bit more obvious. So if I forget about it and a customer gets in their car and they see this and they're like, whoa, what is this hanging down? Or this, this side even has, you can see provisions to latch onto something. So if I wanted to, I could like latch it onto a key, you know, just, I don't know, whatever. But I'm just trying, we're trying to do things to make it, uh, more noticeable and make people more aware of this so that I don't I don't tend to forget it in people's cars because it's super annoying when I have to call someone back and they either have to come back or they say they can't come back for a day or two so now I can't use my scanner for a day or two right so yeah and it still fits on the scanner so slides in no problem pretty neat huh it's a simple solution and hopefully Hopefully it works. Got a charger right here with a 3.5 that I just finished putting a alternator in. Uh, it's a funny story because I was supposed to work on a PT Cruiser, right? It was gonna get dropped off so I could look at it. And then this is the car that they brought to pick them up after they drop off the PT Cruiser, right? Well, turns out the alternator decided to fail on this charger right as it was in front of my house. So they kind of swapped cars. They end up taking a PT Cruiser and they left the charger to put an alternator in it. And as you saw, I'm already all done. So, let's see if I can get a measurement right here. All right, there you go. It's charging and it's all set. This thing looks like it's been hacked up. She told me like her brother-in-law did this because I have no idea stupid reasons yep it's that same charger that uh her brother-in-law or brother whoever the heck is you know taking apart the center console and all that stuff so he's the same guy he keeps hacking up her car but <laughs> what are you gonna do right